And it's almost one year since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, and the war is absolutely having huge impact not only on Ukraine, but also across Europe and across the whole world. What are the policy pathways to tackle and the points of vulnerability to address in Europe as Russia's unprovoked war rages on? And this is what we're going to discuss now at this session. It is a great honor for me to introduce you the speakers of the session. Uh, we have Sanna Marin, Prime Minister of Finland. Gregory Meeks, Congressman for New York, Ranking Member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Maya Sandu, President of the Republic of Moldova. And Jean-Pierre Clamadieu, Chairman of the Board NG Group. My name is Sasha Vakulina. I'm with Euronews and I'm going to be moderating this session. Now, if you want to join the conversation, please use the hashtag WEF23. There's going to also be a possibility for those of you in the audience to ask a question a little bit later to any speaker here. Without further ado, uh, the first question is going to be to Sanna Marine. Let's start this. To what extent has the war resulted in broad shifts when it comes to all these aspects, economic, political, and also military links and connections across Europe? And in what ways can we expect these links and connections to continue to evolve this year as we're going into year two of the war in Europe? Well, thank you for having us in, in this panel. I, I fully agree with the Commission's President Ursula von der Leyen uh, that the war is not only affecting Ukraine, it affects the whole Europe, the whole world actually. We are seeing uh, this geopolitical change in the wor war world uh, and there is a war of values going on in the world. The rules-based order is being challenged and this affects everyone, not only Ukraine, but everyone uh, in, in the world. And the war affects Europe in very concrete ways as well. We are also not only in the war in Ukraine, but also in energy war uh, in, in Europe. Russia is using energy uh, as a tool, as a weapon against Europe, and it, it tries uh, to diminish our support to Ukraine. Putin tries uh, us to be afraid uh, of Russia, what might happen. Uh, he, he wants us and our citizens to think what are the prices uh, of the war, and we are already seeing uh, people frustrated with the high energy prices everywhere in Europe. But the answer is not uh, to weaken our support towards Ukraine. The answer needs to be actually the opposite. We need to send more support to Ukraine more weapons, more humanitarian aid, more financial aid, to make sure that the war will, will end as soon as possible and for Ukrainian win. And this is crucial. So our aspect uh, of Putin's uh, screwdriver that he is using now uh, with the energy against Europe should be that we are sending more support for Ukraine. Let's go about this support with the... Uh, to Gregory Meeks, the next question. Let's pick up on that line and go with, with what further long-term support can be provided from all the allies and any possible support when it comes to NATO, European states and allies further abroad, including the United States, like extend to Ukraine beyond what has already been done? So first let me thank you uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. And let me thank, of course, the uh, Prime Minister Aaron, and, and President uh, to do for their commitment and what you're doing in your countries. You've gone beyond the call of duty, staying together, had the opportunity to visit both and to see how you've taken in Ukrainian people who have ran. And, and it's that kind of unity that's tremendously important, as indicated, because what uh, Putin did not count on was the unity of NATO and EU and other allies all over. And you have exhibited just the closeness and the determination to stand and to make sure that's happening. And we can see the strength and determination of the Ukrainian people. I visited Ukraine. Uh, I was the first uh, one to get into Ukraine after the invasion and the last and the first, you know, I was there, the last Kodel to go to Ukraine before the invasion. And to see and feel the determination of the Ukrainian people is important. So what, can, what else can we do? I think that you saw that uh, the United States just passed the tremendous aid package to go to Ukraine but also now talking about more advanced weapons mm -hmm. uh, so that they have to protect, the, 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 the protect themselves from attacks in the air, uh, looking at, and we see some talking about additional tanks, et cetera. So we can do more by giving more advanced weapons and training them to utilize those weapons 
so that they can protect themselves and to make sure that the heinous acts of, uh, of, 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 of Russia and Putin is, is halted. That's tremendously important. We must also, you know, try to make sure, and I think here's where coordination can happen uh, with other uh, allies, that Putin is targeting the infrastructure mm -hmm. and the energy of the Ukrainian people. And so we can't forget that also. We know that we have a big responsibility. So some, though, need to help the infrastructure because it's cold now in the middle of the winter. And he's counting on us to separate. He's counting on us uh, not, not, to, not to stand together. And I think that uh, by us making sure that voices from the extremes in any of our countries, that they don't win out and they don't hear and we stick together, that is going to be uh, what uh, I, I think will help them to victory. Thank you so much. Uh, President Sandu, alongside socioeconomic disruptions, what are the other key points of vulnerability, vulnerabilities uh, with the effects of the war exposed in Europe? And what is being done to mitigate those vulnerabilities? Because your country has a very specific position when it comes to this war in Europe and Russia's aggression on Ukraine. Well, some of the vulnerabilities have been already mentioned, and this is the energy and the fact that we all relied on um, unreliable uh, sources, uh, to put it this way. Uh, of course, Moldova was more vulnerable because it uh, depended 100% on the gas purchases before the war started. Now we get only 40% of our gas needs uh, in, uh, from Gazprom, and we managed quickly to diversify into to find our uh, other sources uh, to supply uh, energy to the country. Uh, the propaganda, which is a very big issue, disinformation, and this is, of course, a big issue for my country, but I think this is a big issue for many countries, and we need to learn how to be more efficient um, to tackle this issue, is the cyber security. Uh, the frozen conflicts, um, which became a bigger risk uh, during the, the war. So there are lots of vulnerabilities, and the energy prices, I think, I, I agree to, totally agree with the issue that Russia counted on this blackmailing us uh, with the energy crisis, and Europe managed to find a solution. And this was not easy. And I just remember the discussions in April and May when you know there were all kind of uh, proposals, but no one believed probably, or uh, most of the people would not believe that EU will manage to find uh, a solution so quickly. And yes, we have to pay, to pay a price, and, and we feel bad that our people have to pay a high price. But I can tell you that in Moldova, the gas tariff increased seven times uh, in the last 18 months. And this is not a country where people have high revenues. So um, you can understand what are the costs. But we believe in democracy. We value uh, democracy. We want to be part of the free world. And the only solution is to stay together. And yes, it is difficult, but we have to help Ukraine, uh, all of us. We have to uh, stop Russia. We have to help Ukraine uh, win this war, because otherwise all of us will be in danger. Uh, Monsieur Klamadier, which underlying factors of the current economic downturn and potential recession facing Europe you think are most exacerbated by the war? And to what degree will Europe's economic recovery hinge on the outcomes of this war? Because that's another front there. Yeah. No, basically another front, but uh, in fact what I can say echo very much uh, what the President was uh, just saying, because I think it applies uh, also to Europe. I think we've discovered and... Uh, it might sound a bit naive, but I guess we've discovered in February of this year how, how dependent we were on Russian gas. Uh, and we've seen a situation during the first few months of the war where we were really wondering at what point and by whom the, uh, the gas flows would be cut. At the end of the day, it happened in uh, June, July, where we've lost not all, but a very significant part of uh, uh, the energy which was coming from, uh, from Russia. We have reacted very, very quickly. A few key decisions made by the Commission, but a lot of uh, action taken by companies, utilities, uh, energy companies uh, across Europe. Uh, I, w I would say we've seen the situation degrading probably until August with a very significant uh, risk premium put on energy prices. I mean, we've seen uh, gas prices uh, reaching 300 euro per megawatt hour compared to an average of the last 10 years below 20, so a 10 times uh, increase. 
Uh, and at this point of time, we started to see large industries stopping some of their operations in Europe. Fertilizers, steel industries, people who are very dependent on energy, very worrying. And frankly speaking, I think at the end of August, beginning of September, there was this feeling that there would be a major impact on the European economy. At the same time, we were uh, starting to think that there might be disruption in the supply of energy during the winter. The situation was exacerbated by some specific issues like the, uh, the French nuclear fleet being, uh, uh, being under maintenance for, for part of it. Since that, the situation, frankly speaking, has improved uh, very significantly. We've been able to uh, bring very significant quantities of GNL into Europe. Uh, we've been able to fill up our storage at the uh, highest possible level before the, uh, before the winter period. We've been helped by external uh, conditions, and weather was pretty mild at the beginning of, uh, of the winter. Uh, and, but we are in a situation today where I'm pretty confident to say that there won't be disruption in, uh, in the supply of energy, neither gas nor electricity uh, in Europe during the last uh, few months of, uh, of winter. Prices are starting to go down. We are not back where we were uh, uh, two years ago, but we are back at a level which is a bit more uh, sustainable. And I don't want to downplay the impact of this, uh, of this conflict. Uh, obviously, this creates a big competitiveness issues for industries in Europe versus, uh, versus the US. I think it will probably take another couple of years before the flow of uh, natural of GNL uh, LNG, sorry, is uh, again offering uh, visibility for uh, European consumers. But frankly speaking, thanks to the alignment of political decision makers and industries, we've been able to go through uh, this uh, this year of 2022 probably much better than we expected when this conflict started. You know, it's. Um Obviously, the 24th of February in just about a month is going to mark one year. And um, this is the second time the WAF annual meeting after the spring meeting, the second time we are talking about the war in Ukraine and the war in Europe. And when it comes to so many aspects, you know, I hear from the speakers here that we didn't think we could do that much. We didn't think it could be that much unity. We didn't think it could be that much alignment and the reaction would be that good. So let's try to... Um, Everybody wants it's a one billion dollar or even more question about how for how long we're in this and how it's gonna how it's gonna go. What what do you think on that? Well, of course we don't know how long the war war will continue, but I think we can uh, affect the situation also. And the key elements right now, and it's to do with the, the how united we have been. Yeah. The key elements are that we have to say very uh, frankly uh, and out loud that we will support Ukraine as long as needed. There isn't that kind of scenario or possibility that, that the support from Europe or the Western world or democracies will diminish. That's not a possibility. We will support as long as needed. Five years, 10 years, 15 years, whatever it takes, we will support Ukraine. And this will not stop. And it's for Ukrainians to decide when they are ready to negotiate, when they are ready uh, to make uh, some peace agreement that they could agree on. And we will support. Our job is to support them. Uh, and this is a message that needs to be sent very clearly, that our, our mission is to support and, and we will support as long as needed. And another uh, way that we could uh, influence uh, the the situation. Uh, we are already uh, sending arms, we are sending weapons, and we need to send more and more advanced weapons. We need to continue sending financial support and uh, humanitarian support, uh, taking uh, refugees from Ukraine, putting heavier sanctions against Russia. But one thing that I really think that might uh, affect the situation is the frozen assets. There are a lot of frozen assets from the Russian Central Bank, a lot of frozen assets from uh, oligarchs, uh, and we need to find solutions. How to use these assets? I know it's legally, uh, and, and from a legal point of view, it's a very difficult matter and very difficult issue, but I think we need to find solutions. How to use these funds to support Ukraine? To rebuild Ukraine, I think this 
could affect uh, the war more than we think, because there are many interests behind these assets and this, uh, this money. So, so I think that might really affect the situation. It doesn't solve everything, but I think that's the one thing that we haven't yet used. And I think we need to find the legal framework uh, to do this, to use those assets to support Ukraine. And this process of rebuilding and reconstruction, it's not being postponed. It's not like mm. wh when the war is over, that's going to happen now. We, you have all known, and you visited the country, you know exactly that it has already started step by step. It's from the regions, it's from the suburbs, uh, the places that have been liberated. Mm. They're already being reconstructed. So this is, of course, uh, something that is already on and is going to be in focus mm. this year as well. Yeah. Um, Gregory Mix, what's your assessment of the possible trajectories of what the war in Ukraine might take going into 2023? And what possible trajectories could NATO take as well? Well, first, I think that what's unshakable and unbreakable is the Ukrainian people's resolve. They, you know, when I visited prior to the invasion, what I wanted to know was whether or not the Ukrainian people would fight. Truth of the matter is, I went, whether I talked to the person that was driving the taxis, or that was in the hotel, or that was waiting in the restaurants, I've asked them, if Russia attacked, what would they do? And they said, we would fight. And they referred back to 2014 and said, they will never, ever allow what happened in Crimea to happen in their native land. They will never yield to Putin and Russia. They were absolute about that. And we see them continuing to fight. And so I think that you will continue to see Ukraine winning this war and fighting when we give them the ammunition and what they need to fight. Because that determination, that's not going to change. That's unshakable. And what is as the Prime Minister just indicated, that is absolutely devastating to Putin is our solid unity. He's hoping and looking for ways to shake it. So we've got to make sure that, and I think that the Russia propaganda is going to be defeated moving forward. Some individuals, you know, when I moved around before and I talked to some people, even some in the United States, uh, at one point, listening to the propaganda, thinking that, you know, as Russia was talking about, that it was Ukraine that was being the aggressors. Obviously not true. So I see that us coming closer together and bringing in other allies from other areas of the world also. Because as this intensifies and they see the humanitarian crises that is taking place, when they see that people are forced that, that, that are being utilized, civilians are being utilized, killed, freezing to death in, 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 in cold weather, when they see the human dangers that have been taking place and how it is a humanitarian criminal act that Putin is committing, that will bring us even closer together. So as I look at where we're going down, we're not going to get weak. I know, you know people have talked about uh, certain things because of the Congress has changed in the United States of America, that now in the House, for example, it's, uh, it's a split. Overwhelmingly, the American people, overwhelmingly the people, for example, Democrats and Republicans, are focused and standing strongly behind Ukraine. And that's only going to intensify as we move forward, which makes me believe that that will lead to success in the long run as we get through the winter and into the summertime. And it's really similar uh, when it comes to the support in Europe. According to the latest poll, it was over 70% of the Europeans fully supporting the EU response and the EU support and help to Ukraine. So this is also one of those things. The other aspect I want to go now is that the war in Ukraine, as a consequence, had a we all have a greater appreciation of alliances as well and working together, and of course NATO being one of them. So I'm going to ask you about that. Uh, you know, when Finland and Sweden obviously announced NATO aspiration, there was this uh, 
there was this tweet that said, I can't remember the author, and I apologize if you were the author, that what Putin tried to do, he wanted to Finlandization of Ukraine, but instead what he did was Ukrainization of Finland and Sweden. So you are now on the way there. So what, to, to what extent, uh, how is the process going? Because this was uh, Sweden and Finland, NATO aspiration happened in response to the war in Ukraine. And how is it going? How is the cooperation happening in the solidarity as well? Because you are doing it, not just yourself, but you said that you're going to be doing it only hand in hand with Sweden. Because mm. that's another alliance, that's another appreciation of alliances. Mm. Well, the Finnish atmosphere uh, and the mindset of people changed at the same time when Russia attacked Ukraine. In that mo before that moment, uh, if you ask Finnish people, do they think that Finland should join NATO, the uh, majority would have said, no, we have that possibility to apply. That's very important that we have that possibility. But we didn't have that kind of discussion, active discussion before. And if you ask the, the majority of, of Finnish people or the parliament, they would have said, no, we don't see that, that we should right now apply to NATO membership. But when Russia attacked Ukraine, everything changed. The world changed. Our neighbor was no longer the same neighbor. Uh, it was uh, aggressive, uh, aggressive neighbor that went uh, across that border. And, and Finnish people asked themselves, what is the border that Russia wouldn't cross? And that's the NATO border. And that's why Finnish people uh, wanted uh, us to go to NATO. Uh, 188 uh, parliamentarians out of 200 voted in favor of NATO uh, membership. So we we are not, we don't have 100%, but we are very close uh, in, in our parliament as well. Uh, and we have this, this unity in Finland. We have this uh, cohesion and consensus about the NATO application. And I'm also very happy that we made this decision at the same time that, that our Swedish neighbors uh, did, because we are also sharing, of course, the same geopolitical uh, atmosphere, the same geopolitical security environment. So I think from NATO's perspective also, it's very important that Finland and Sweden is applying and, and entering NATO together. Of course, there are still two countries that hasn't ratified, Hungary and Turkey. And I have talked, uh, for example, with, with uh, Prime Minister Orban uh, every time that we meet uh, in, in European Council. And, and he has uh, said that they will ratify as soon as the parliament will start uh, its uh, term this spring, hopefully very soon. Uh, Turkey, we don't have that timetable yet. Of course, we hope that that will happen sooner uh, than later. We are fulfilling uh, all the criteria, if we are ticking all the boxes uh, that is needed to become a NATO member. And actually, for example, Finland is already using over 2% of our GDP to defense. And we have done this for quite some time. And we are seeing a lot of uh, support from Ukrainian people to fight for their country. They are fighting for their freedom, for their independence and their country. And if you ask Finnish people how willing they are de to, f to defend Finland, I think we are ranked number one. Ukraine is number two. So, so we have been in war with Russia and, and we know what that's like. And we don't want ever again, ever again, there to be a war in Finnish soil. And that's why we are applying to NATO so that there wouldn't be a war in Finland ever again. That's the border that Russia wouldn't cross, and that's why we're applying to NATO. President Sondu, uh, Moldova is applying for the European Union. That's another, of course, as well, alliance and this appreciation of it. How important is that? How, and how also the view on it changed? Because Moldova has also experienced some of the opinion polls that were not necessarily always... Uh, supporting the idea and also uh, just to follow up on um, what Gregory Meek said there the propaganda issue of course is something that happened a lot in Moldova over years. Well um, I actually believe that Moldova's chance to survive as a democracy is only within the EU and just being realistic about what's going to happen in our region in the next I don't know 10-15 years of course we uh, all hope for a uh, victory for a speedy victory of Ukraine, and this is going to happen. But uh, we cannot uh, see Russia becoming a democratic country uh, very soon, and this means that the uh, challenges for the region are still going to be there. 
Uh, Moldova survived, I mean, managed to deal with the challenges uh, that you asked me at the beginning uh, in, in, uh, and to a big extent thanks to the support we received from the EU and from the uh, development partners, and we are very grateful. And it is important to have a stable Moldova. It's important for us. It's important for Ukraine. It's important for the EU. For the EU, it is important to have a peaceful and stable Ukraine. It is important to have a peaceful and stable Moldova, and that's why the EU enlargement is important. I think Ukraine has proved it's paying the highest price uh, for the democracy and for uh, the EU values. Uh, Moldovans have been doing their best, and yes, the propaganda is uh, still strong, and we are fighting with the propaganda, but we have more than 70% of people uh, over the years, despite the propaganda, uh, despite the poverty and the many problems we've been facing, we have this uh, constant support for the EU integration, and I think the recent um, gesture by the, uh, the generosity showed by the Moldovan people when they managed to help uh, six, seven hundred thousand of, uh, of Ukrainian uh, refugees shows that we, uh, we value the, the EU values and uh, we value peace and we value freedom. Um, so the EU enlargement will make the EU stronger uh, because the EU needs a peaceful and stable Ukraine, Moldova and the rest of the countries which are aspiring for the, for the EU accession. President Santos, do you think, uh, as a long shot for the bit longer future, do you think that NATO aspirations is something that Moldova could go into after? We do feel how vulnerable we are, and actually, if uh, you know, Ukraine is defending us literally, um, and we are uh, taking steps to improve our um, defense sector, but we are very realistic about what we can do. Uh, we are a democratic country, and we have to have the discussion. There, there should be uh, popular support, but we are having this serious discussion now on, on whether we can, by ourselves, uh, defend us in a new world where we see that war is a real danger. And, and this was not the understanding five years ago, ten years ago, when everybody thought that wars cannot happen on our continent. Uh Jean-Pierre Clamadieu, let me uh, bring you to one of the factors that has been identified as the one of the biggest long-term risks according to this year's WAV Global Risks Report. This is, of course, the concerns over climate and the transition to cleaner energy, because this is another massive, massive field there to discuss. And, but we have also been seeing, as you mentioned before, some of the transition already starting and speeding up. But... How have the impacts of the war in Ukraine reshaped the global energy landscape? And what are your expectations when it comes to speeding up this transition away from fossil fuel dependency as well on Russian, but also the transition in general? Maybe before answering your question, just to comment, I'm here as a business leader, but I'm also a European citizen. And I really want to express my support and, in fact, my pride to see how Europe was able to react to this situation and also my admiration to uh, political leaders like Prime Minister uh, Sarin. I think, uh, I think we should be proud of the way Europe was able to react as a, uh, with a lot of alignment between various stakeholders. And by the way, if we still see very high level of uh, public support to, um, to this position in Europe, the fact that business was able to manage the situation uh, mitigating some of the impact, making sure that there would not be major disruption in the energy system and limiting the impact on unemployment, I think all of this is really helping create this support. Now I think the, uh, the challenge for Europe is really to make sure that we can strengthen our energy system and this is completely aligned with the, uh, the need for, uh, to speed up the energy transition. We uh, don't have any uh, uh, fossil, fossil resources in Europe, a bit of coal, but it's not something we want to, to build on. So the challenge now is to make sure that we can speed up the development of renewable. The EU has an agenda, the Fit for 55 agenda. We need to make sure that the current situation, the mitigation of the crisis does not slow down this agenda. On the contrary, and what we see today is a number of uh, decisions which indeed should create the conditions for us to speed up development of renewable, to speed up development of storage, speed up the development of hydrogen. This is absolutely what we need. 
And by the way, what's currently happening in the U.S. with the now very famous IRA uh, is creating challenges for us because the U.S. has developed a very powerful and very simple tool to create this, uh, this energy transition in North America. EU needs to react. And I know that President Macron is putting a, a number of proposals on the table at the, uh, at the Council. We need to make sure that Europe develops its own IRA once again with this objective of speeding up energy transition. This will help us achieve strategic independence and this is something that we absolutely need. Thank you so much. We're going to be now taking a few questions from the audience. So if you have them, can you please raise your hand so that we could see? And we're going to get the microphone there. Would you just introduce yourself and then ask your question? I know there are lots of uh, topics and the questions that you would like to ask the speakers. I'm just going to ask you to stick to the topic of this session. Could you stand up? Definitely, I will stand up as well. Hello, my name is Sakari Terekoski. I'm from the Global Shaper Stockholm Hub. And my question was about what you actually started the session with, which is the support to Ukraine. Would it be realistic to hope that also other democratic nations outside of the Europe, outside of NATO, would, would join in giving support to Ukraine, including perhaps weapons? Thank you. Please. Uh, concerning weapons, uh, of course, those are national decisions, but actually many other countries are already uh, doing uh, a lot. They are supporting, for example, I visited uh, New Zealand and Australia and they are also supporting Ukraine and, and I think the democratic partners across the world, they are supporting everyone, different way, but the most important thing is that they are supporting. This is uh, a common challenge uh, and as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, it's not only, uh, to the, it's, the situation isn't, isn't only the war in Ukraine. The global situation is the challenging of our values, challenging the rule-based order. There are other authoritarian regimes there that are watching very closely to Ukraine. And if Russia would win in Ukraine, I'm, I bet there would be other countries in the world that are looking, oh, that pays off, that pays off. You want to another nation, you can gain land, you can gain natural resources, that pays off. And that's why we need to make sure that Ukraine will win, that the war will stop in Ukraine, that this kind of spheres of influence, this kind of world where there are no rules, that wouldn't continue, because then we will be decades and decades in these kind of situations, and that's not a very bright future, and that's why everybody needs to support. Us Europeans, the states are doing a lot, and I'm very grateful that the states are so heavily involved in Ukraine. They are sending a lot of weapons, they are sending a lot of financial support, and we couldn't cope without the United States support right now. And that's why we need European strategic autonomy, that's why we need to build our own defense capabilities, our own capabilities in the future, all the critical aspects, to make sure that, that we can also cope, uh, not only to rely uh, in, in our partners, even though I'm sure that the states would help also in the future, but we need to be more strong as Europe uh, also. Let me just add to that because even here in Davos, mm. as I've talked to other countries from Asia, for example, they are also locked in to try to make sure there's contributions in regards to uh, making sure that Ukraine wins this war. So yes, I think there's a lot. And I think others will join too because here's where, when I was talking about Russian prop prom propaganda ending, because Russia has been trying to utilize the blockage of grains that's causing others to starve. But they are trying, their propaganda says it's Ukraine that's doing it. As that continues to be revealed, who's actually blocking the ports and the seas and who's causing the starvation, that too will take some who may not be actively right now over the long, to switch because they will see how it's affecting their nation. That's why as the prime minister and, and the president has indicated this is bigger than just Ukraine because other nations are affected by it. The t inflation is affected by what is taking place because of the aggression of Russia. So all of the countries that are talking about and seeing high inflation, they too will see as we move on how, why it's significant and important for all of us to join together to make sure that Russia is not winning this war. President Sante, would you comment on that, on the importance of other countries as well providing this help and providing the support when they can, not only from uh, the European Union? 
Well, first of all, uh, as I said, we need to have a better information about the war. And we need, and this is not just in our region, uh, the, the propaganda, I was surprised to, to see the Russian propaganda uh, working in countries which are very far from Russia. I thought it was just my country because it, it was so close. Uh, but I think everybody needs to understand this issue, that if Russia is allowed to do what it is doing today in Ukraine, then next time this can happen to other countries. Uh, it, it's really, it goes beyond Ukraine, it goes beyond the region, and then people should understand that even though they might feel that they're paying you know, a high price for that, still this price is much, much lower than the price that people in Ukraine pay because they pay with their lives. Uh, Monsieur Klamadio, that also, if I rephrase that question and if I bring it a little bit more in the narrower, when it comes to energy wars and everything, this was also something, the situation where uh, in many cases the support and the help were, were looking for that outside of the European Union, for example, outside of Europe with some new countries popping in. How important is that and do you see it as a possible prospect? Well, yes, I mean, we've seen, um, I think, this, uh, this situation has uh, emphasized the importance of uh, uh, GN LNG, sorry, the, uh, the fact that LNG is to the form of energy which, uh, uh, which obviously has a very important role to play in Europe, not forever, but probably for the next 15 years. Uh, and uh, LNG is coming from different countries. US is a very significant uh, producer and exporter of LNG. We have a number of uh, countries in the Gulf region. Uh, and this, uh, indeed, this geography of energy is changing due to this crisis. Uh, and probably we'll see some future changes uh, uh, in, the next, uh, in the next few years. We had a situation where Asia was also very dependent on uh, LNG. My feeling is that they are uh, starting to build the infrastructure which will allow Russia to send to ship its gas to Asia. And this will free up quantities of LNG which will go into, uh, into Europe. So very significant changes. But again, we should not forget that strategic independence is absolutely key for Europe. Energy is an element of vulnerability just because we don't have any uh, energy on our <coughs> below our feet or uh, around us. So we need to produce it. And the best way to produce it is to go full speed into low carbon energy, renewable and nuclear for countries uh, where nuclear is acceptable. Thank you. We've got questions here in the first row. If we could get the microphone here. Michael Young from uh, Politik Denmark. I would like to ask um, President Sandu, there were some warnings in December that uh, there was, was an, uh, an imminent Russian offensive coming up in, in the beginning of this year and that you were also in, in the danger zone. Uh, could you put some words on the situation right now and tell us if you need more security guarantees than you have now? Well, um, I wouldn't say that the risk of uh, the, the military threat is bigger today than what it was in the spring of last year. Uh, when we knew that if Ukraine does not resist, then in the next few days, Russians will, will get to Kishinev. So there was no question about that. Um, today, the situation depends on what happens in Ukraine. And we see Ukraine resisting and we see Ukraine advancing, so it's really about the, the, the Ukrainian situation and, and uh, when you help Ukraine, you also help us and you help other countries in the region. But otherwise, of course, we are vulnerable and um, there is not much we can do in a short period of time. As I said, we are having a dialogue at home about our military situation, about the neutrality, but this is a democratic country and any changes, any decisions have to be taken with popular support. We have another question here, if we may. The first row, thank you. Hello. Thank you very much for this. This is Iqbal Halival from MIT. I have a question, we, you know, how much of this is Putin's war versus Russia's war? And has your assessment changed the, of your intelligence agencies about how much support does Putin really have? Because over and over again, the, you know, the message in the West is, oh, now the mobilization is going to happen and this is going to be the end of Putin. He's going to lose support. Now so many dead bodies are coming back. It's going to be end. But it seems like this is more sticky. <coughs> is it just Putin's war or is it actually Russia's war? And what can you do to make it Putin's war versus Russia's war? 
It's a great Thank question. You. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's quite a difficult question because Russia isn't a democratic country. So when we are seeing polls about the support uh, of, of this war, uh, can we trust those polls? Are people answering those, those polls and questions uh, the way that they think that they need to uh, answer because there isn't actually another choice? So, so we don't know, are those polls or, or uh, Christian um, polls very trustworthy? Uh, I think this is Putin's war, and it's also Russia's war. Uh, there are uh, Russian people fighting in Ukraine. There are many of those who are turning their eye another way. Uh, and in the end, uh, I don't think the question is the key one. Uh, I think the only key question is when the war will end, how will it end, uh, and the, the only answer that, that needs to be that Ukraine will win, and Ukraine will win with our support. We don't know what will happen within Russia. Uh, I have, of course, uh, spoke uh, also with, with Russian people, also with ACT, activists that are against uh, Putin uh, and, and their message is that there isn't that much of support of Putin's policy uh, when it comes to Ukraine, but people are afraid. They are afraid of saying their opinion, they are afraid uh, of the regime, uh, what it might do, and this is, this is not a new situation. We have seen this uh, from, from many years. First, you put down the, the opposition uh, and the civil society. You lock up your opponents. Uh, you silence the media. You take control within your country. And then uh, these kind of uh, matters can happen. And I really worry that there are also other countries where we can see this same, same kind of, of um, change going on. And are we reacting soon enough? Are we supporting those critical voices uh, within democratic countries that are still democratic countries? Or are we just thinking that that's not important right now? Let's see in the future. I really worry about European nations as well. There are a few European nations where we are seeing the same kind of logic. That first, your opponents, opposition, human rights, rights of women, uh, rights of minorities that aren't that important, attack them, and then in the end there is this very uh, nasty and, and evil spiral uh, of, of authoritarian so in my, way of thinking. In my mind there's no question Putin's war. No question about it. He's lying to his people. That's when you talk about Russian propaganda, not only outside of Russia, but especially inside of Russia. And he tries, and when you have an authoritarian government, as is in Russia, you try to build up nationalism to make some of the people feel that they are strong with their country, that their country is doing right. What he is feeding his people are lies. And I believe that as long as this, if this continues to long, lies are revealed. And the people in Russia build up. I was recently in... Egypt, and watching the number of Russians, especially those that would be drafted, leaving Russia, trying to go to other places because they didn't want to lose their lives. But the propaganda inside of Russia, I've got a friend of mine who has family still in Russia. They call their family members and say, this is what's going on. And they said, that would, they don't believe it. They believe what they're hearing in Russia. So <coughs> it's not, there's some good people in Russia. But it is Putin's war because of the lies and the criminal acts that he is committing upon people, utilizing, you know, if you see he's firing generals and others that don't want, he's throwing them out of windows or having, you know, all of a sudden they, you know, supposed to be committing suicide. It is definitively Putin's war. President Sandu, what's your take on that? Because that question is something that you would probably feel strong about. I think we can all agree that this is a war that Putin started, and this is a war that Putin can stop. We can't say 
how much support there is for the war in Russia because of the reasons that the previous speakers mentioned. But it's clearly started by him. It can end if he wants it. The f I can't. I'm so sorry. I wish. Uh, and the final words from you, Monsieur Clemenceau. The final comment from you on the... No, again, uh, I think uh, unity and alignment is key within Europe, with our uh, close allies. Uh, and uh, I think we've, uh, we've been able not to be... Uh, we've been able to resist to Putin's view that energy will create uh, fracture within, uh, within Europe. So I think it's really a, a very good result. Let's make sure that we continue with this type of, of alignment for 2023. Thank you so much. And if I may, just very quickly, uh, from my side, commenting on your question, I myself was in Kiev on Maidan exactly when the invasion started. And I lived through the situation and covered the invasion from the capital of Ukraine. There is a debate whether this is Putin's war or Russian's war, but this is certainly the war of every single Ukrainian mm. who is there or who is now in any mm. other country and found the refuge there. Thank you so much for this session and thank you so much for the questions. I wish we had more time, hopefully next time. Thank you. Thank you so much.